Hi, welcome to Nourishful. I'm Dr. Lara. In this mini lecture, we're going to talk about metabolism from a systemic perspective. So let's talk about metabolism across the body. Um, in our last lecture, we talked about a whole series of different anabolic and catabolic reactions. However, not all tissues in the body can perform all of these metabolic pathways. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk through different organs in the body, talk about what metabolic pathways they can perform, and also talk about what their primary favorite fuel sources are, because every cell needs energy. So starting off in the liver, um, first of all, the liver gets the first pass of nutrients from the gastrointestinal tract. If we think back to our first lecture on the GI tract, um, we remember that all of those, uh, all the carbohydrates and proteins that were absorbed across the entire side directly into the bloodstream, that blood went straight to the liver before it goes to the rest of the body. And that allows the liver to take up the first dose of carbohydrates and proteins that we have digested from our food. So the liver gets the first pass of nutrients from the GI tract. From there, um, let's talk about what kind of metabolic processes the liver can do. So the liver can perform both glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. So the liver is one of the few organs in the body that can form glycogen, the storage form of glucose. So glycogenesis is building glucose into glycogen, into the storage form. Glycogenolysis is when we want to take that glycogen and break it apart so we can release glucose into the bloodstream. Um, the next uh, metabolic pathway that the liver can do is gluconeogenesis. Remember that gluconeogenesis is when we build glucose. So that's when we started with oxaloacetate from the Krebs cycle, converted that into phosphoenopyruvate or, pre uh, or PEP, and then we essentially take PEP and go through glycolysis backwards to yield glucose. So the liver is, again, one of the few organs in the body that can actually perform this gluconeogenesis function. The other uh, organs that can also do gluconeogenesis are the kidneys. The liver can perform lipogenesis, building fats. The liver can perform ketogenesis. So remember, ketogenesis is when we our Krebs cycle is blocked up, it's slowed down. So instead of shuttling acetyl-CoA into the Krebs cycle, we take that acetyl-CoA and we bind it with another acetyl-CoA in order to ultimately form ketones. And ketones can then be used as an energy source by other tissues in the body. So that's ketogenesis. The liver can do ketogenesis. The liver is also um, heavily involved in protein synthesis, uh, specifically of forming a lot of um, blood proteins like albumin. So the liver is very actively involved in protein synthesis. Um, and the liver is critical for deamination. Remember that deamination is where we take amino acids and we take the amine nitrogen containing group off of the amino acids, so we're left with just this carbon skeleton. Um, so once the liver has deaminated amino acids, it will then take that amine group and it will convert it into urea. And remember that is very important because um, the ammonia that comes from that amine group would be toxic to the brain. So we have to do something so that when we de a whole bunch of amino acids that we don't then generate a whole bunch of toxic ammonia floating through our bloodstream. So the liver plays a very critical role in taking that ammonia and converting it into urea, a nice harmless compound that we can then excrete safely in our urine. Now, what kind of fuel does the liver like? The liver isn't too picky. Um, the liver will mostly use fatty acids as its energy source, um, but it can also use glucose or amino acids for energy too. So that's the liver. Now, sometimes I think um, when we're doing kind of these foundational science courses in nutrition, I think that they are really courses that are an ode to the liver because the liver is such a critical organ in integrating metabolism across the entire body. So I love the liver. Let's move on to the brain. So the brain, the primary fuel source for the brain is glucose. The brain is a very hungry organ. It needs a constant, steady supply of energy, and its preferred energy source is glucose. What is especially to point, important to point out here is that the brain cannot use fat for energy. So our body has evolved to make sure that it can constantly supply glucose to the brain. Now, I did mention that the brain can adapt to using ketones for fuel as well, but first and foremost, the brain's preferred fuel source is glucose. 
Let's move on to the muscle. So the muscle is another organ that can also store glycogen. So the muscle can perform glycogenesis where it takes glucose molecules and builds them into glycogen. The muscle can also perform glycogenolysis where it takes that glycogen and breaks it apart. Now, Unlike the liver, where when the liver performs glycogenolysis, it releases that glucose into the bloodstream to help maintain systemic blood glucose concentrations, the muscle is a little bit more selfish in that when the muscle breaks down its glycogen through glycogenolysis, the muscle really has preference for using that glycogen itself to fuel uh, contractions in the muscle itself. But the muscle is one of the other organs that can store glycogen, the energy storage form of glucose. The um, muscle can use glucose or fatty acids or ketones for fuel. However, the muscle will primarily use fatty acids for fuel when it's at rest and primarily use glucose for fuel during exercise. Um, and then the muscle can also uh, is also involved in the lactic acid system. Remember, we talked about the lactic acid system as being active when we are situa in situations where there's insufficient, insufficient oxygen. Um, and so the lactic acid system allows us to run the first part of glycolysis, where we can generate a little bit of ATP, a little bit of energy, and then the lactic acid system will allow us to take all of that reduced NADH and oxidize it back to NAD so we can continue to run that first part of glycolysis. So the muscle can perform, um, is involved in the lactic acid system. Next, let's talk about the adipose. I'm representing that over here with a bunch of adipocytes. So the adipose tissue is involved in lipolysis, lysis, breaking apart fat. So lipolysis is when we are cleaving fatty acids off of the glycerol backbone of a triglyceride. When the adipose is going to perform lipolysis, what it will do is then release fatty acids into the bloodstream. Um, the adipose tissue is also involved in lipogenesis, building fats, taking those two carbons from acetyl-CoA's and adding them together, together, together to build nice long fatty acid chains, lipogenesis. Um, now the uh, adipose tissue is the major site in our body for triglyceride storage. And remember last time we talked about how triglycerides are really the best, most efficient form of energy storage in our body. We have a limited capacity to store glycogen because glycogen tends to get bind with water and it makes it really heavy. Whereas we can pack lots of triglycerides together. Um, they are hydrophobic, they can pack nicely together. And so triglycerides are really a great way for us to store lots of energy in a really efficient manner, we have an unlimited um, ability to store more triglyceride as energy. Um, now, as far as fueling the adipocytes themselves, uh, adipose tissue will mostly use gl glucose as fuel, but it can also use fatty acids.